Amen. Please be seated. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, as we worship you at this time, we seek now to reflect upon a portion of your holy word. We pray that you will quieten our anxiousness, that you will remove our doubts and fears. We pray, God, that you will enable faith to arise in our souls, that you will give us clarity of thought. And Lord, even as we yield ourselves to you, that you will minister to us at our point of need. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Perfect health remedy. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is true, Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Martin Luther, the 16th century German theologian and religious reformer, says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man can stake his life on it a thousand times. Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19, tells of the aftermath of the lame man being healed at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. This reading leads to the juncture of urging the forgiveness of sins based on faith in Jesus. Undoubtedly, there is a connection between the healing of the layman and the forgiveness of sins. For faith in the name of Jesus is essential and perfect health is a thrilling option. You and I must understand well that faith is not docile. Faith is not something that is abstract, that is put up and we just look at it. Faith is rather the action driven with God abundantly given and we undeservingly receiving. It is important that we understand that, that it is God who gives and we who are undeserving receive because of God's abundant grace. Of course, as a consequence of our childlike trust in Jesus Christ, this faith will be exhibited in this way. So one of the very essential components of our active faith is for us to trust Jesus in the same way that a little child will trust his parent. I remember there was an occasion some years ago when I would go to a particular church and although I was not the parent of the child, after the worship service, the child will come to me for me to throw it up in the air and catch it. And that went on Sunday after Sunday that I went to that particular congregation. And then one day it stopped. 
Now you and I can understand why. Because the child was growing up and the child now had doubted my ability to keep cashing it. And perhaps he's right. The point is that you can tell a child to jump off of any height and if the child trusts you, particularly the parent, lovingly, the child will jump. For the child expects you to catch it. We have to be like children in being trusting with Jesus. Conversely, doubt blurs our spiritual vision and doubts twist our thoughts in a manner that places a division, a schism between God and us. So that when we begin to encourage doubt, we begin to have a situation where less and less we trust God. In the story, as we link it with the other scripture readings that were read, clearly the issue at hand is the removal of the stain of sin and the resulting liberation of humanity. That is really what salvation is all about. And you and I must understand that. That is serious battle between God on our behalf and evil. Verse 2 of the hymn 297, penned by Charles Wesley, tells us, The seed of sin's disease, spirit of health, we move. Spirit of finished holiness, spirit of perfect love. Listen to this example. Fighting to eliminate a life of sin by dealing with our sins one by one is like a person sweeping up dry leaves against the windy conditions. You and I know it wouldn't work. The leaves will keep coming back. What about if we change the environment and swept in the current of the wind? With sin being a deadly disease, and I want to repeat that, sin is a deadly disease in our lives. The solution must be Jesus with the healing and sanctifying of our souls and not any of us trying to see if we can defeat the sins by ourselves one by one. So let us look at the healing of the lame man in that context against the background of the subject, perfect health remedy. And as we look at that story that led to that beautiful and powerful reading in Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19, I want to suggest, one, the availability of Jesus' name. Two, the power of Jesus' name. And three, the completeness of Jesus' name. One, availability of Jesus' name. Fresh air and clean water are essentials for a healthy life. Yet, there are several places in our earthly living spaces where the air and water are very polluted. Despite this, nevertheless, 
the inhabitants exist in communities just like us. They own things just like us and they lovingly relate just like us. Sadly though, ill health is widespread with many suffering from various life-threatening diseases. Happily, as development takes place, the essentials of life become available and increasingly people live healthy lives. The man who was lame from birth was daily taken into the confines of the temple to beg for assistance from those entering the house of God. Have you ever wondered why they left him at the gate while everybody else went inside? On the surface, he was treated kindly because he would have been taken from his home and brought to the precepts of the temple. He even would have reached his adulthood despite the fact that he was lame. And he had now come in contact with Peter and John as two of the many persons who would have constantly been passing him day in and day out. Peter and John were disciples of Jesus. But the man may not have known this, for he begged in the normal manner, expecting to receive whatever they gave him. And most times we can bet it would have been money. Previously, the man would have gone home seemingly happy each day, even though much was missing from his life. But he was unceremoniously unclean. That is why he couldn't go into the temple to worship. From his physical well-being, he was inhibited. That is why he had to be brought and placed by the gate. And he would not have praised God in the manner like his fellow Jews who were in the temple because he was outside some distance from where they were. I want you, my brothers and sisters, to catch the picture that I'm painting for you. Each one of us was born crippled by the same nature. And while we can eat, drink, and be merry, unsaved, our righteous acts are like filthy rags, and we are spiritually inhibited. I want you to allow that to sink in, for the effect of sin upon our lives is not going to prevent you from getting a job, having a good education, having a nice home. However, what is going to prevent you from doing is being whole as the scripture puts in here, having perfect health. And it will prevent you from being able to be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. The wholesomeness of reconciliation with God in Jesus Christ will be missing. And that is vital. For you and I must be reconciled to God so that life can be so much different for us. But there is delightful news this morning. 
We don't have to stop at the fact that the man was brought and placed by the gate lame. And that, in a sense, is all that the scripture would have said about him there because he would have remained there receiving whatever he could and being brought back there. He got no further in his life except for the encounter with Peter and John in the name of Jesus. And what is the delightful news? Jesus is available today. Jesus is available and by faith in his name, his name alone, our current condition can be radically changed. Our current sin-stained condition can be altered. That is why Jesus came and died, and that is why he has been risen from the dead, so that you and I can experience full salvation, including the removal of the sin stain upon our lives. So the battle with sin it's not for you and I to fight up by ourselves to see if we can move this sin and then we go to another one. The battle is the laws. And therefore, the battle is for us to place our lives in the hand of God and allow God to remove the sin stain condition on our lives. So remember, never forget, Jesus is available. Two, power of Jesus' name. As a child, I live in a community with no electricity, and it was dark and dismal at night with the villagers usually shut up in their homes after the sun had set and the darkness of the night had enveloped the surroundings. Then one day electricity came to the community and life in the village was changed, changed for the better because of the late surroundings we were now able to go outside and to associate after dark. And of course, electricity brought other benefits, such as refrigeration, etc. We are told that as usual, the man was placed at the gate of the temple. However, on the momentous day, he encountered the power of Jesus' name and resultingly he was healed and was able to stand and walk. It was not because of Peter and John. And one of the mistakes that we often make is that we believe that healing comes from the messenger Healing comes from Jesus Christ and the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. And because this man encountered Jesus and he was healed, new life had become his experience. And excitedly, the man did not sit there any longer begging for arms. He got up and the scripture says he was jumping and praising God, something that he hardly would have ever done. Certainly the praising God he couldn't get up before from his birth. Instructively, material acquisition was not the priority. 
When this man received healing, the priority was not about how much money he could get by the begging. The priority rather was his oneness with God. And the fact that he was praising God joyfully, everybody else around focused on what was happening with him. It was almost as though it was different from what they were accustomed to. And the honest truth is that when we open our lives completely to God and allow God to take over our lives, we behave in a way that others do not always understand. There are people who will call us names because they don't understand the movement of the Spirit in our lives. That is why it is important for us to recognize the power of the name of Jesus in our lives. Beloved in Christ, when we acknowledge our sinfulness, when we acknowledge our sinful state, I'm not talking about when we sin and then we make excuses for our sin. I'm talking about when you and I recognize that we were born with a sin nature. You and I recognize what our natural inclination would be to sin from the time the child is born all the way up. The lameness of the sin-stained life is there. When we recognize that and we decide that we will commit in faith to Jesus, we become healed spiritually and otherwise and we experience the power of Jesus' name. And that is a fact. That is a fact. And the truth is that we can preach sermon after sermon after sermon, but what remains constant is that we have to acknowledge our sinfulness, we have to commit our lives to Jesus, and we have to allow the power of Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit to take over our lives. When you and I allow that to happen and the work of transformation starts and continues in our lives, we don't have to run anywhere. The change is going to come. You and I will even hate sin so much that we'll want to be out of it. And the work will continue. And we will become more and more joyful in the Lord because we are not fighting the battle ourselves. We will never win the battle against sin ourselves. We will never, never win. No matter who we are, no matter how much religious maturity we think we have, we must give it all to Jesus. And we will never be the same again. Never. For the Holy Spirit not only starts the work of transformation in us, but the Holy Spirit liberates us and our minds are renewed. When Paul wrote to the Philippians and others about the renewal of the minds, Romans chapter 12, for example, he was not talking about you and I going home and coming up with any special recipe. He was talking that in Jesus, as we yield to him, we are renewed. Our minds are renewed. And as one him puts it, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim when we look at Jesus, when we focus on Jesus. And the wonderful thing about it 
And I'm sure that Sister Sherry will love to hear this. The wonderful thing about it is the more we give ourselves to God, the happier shall be our circumstances. The happier shall be our marriages when husband and wife give themselves to the Lord. The happier shall be our employment when we as Christians behave as Christians on the job. That we are on time and we work well and we are honest. We don't have to fail. We can enjoy our work. When you and I have anything at all to do and we do it to the best of our ability, we enjoy doing things. We don't have to run away from doing things. When you and I are studying for degrees, we ask the Lord, Lord, show me what is the degree that I should get. We don't just do things to please ourselves. We endeavor to please God and to do his will. When we are building a home, when we are buying a car, whatever it is we are doing, we say, Lord, guide me here. I need your guidance because we are now the laws. We are not the evil ones any longer. Satan has no grip on us. And that is the secret of you and I walking in the Lord. Satan, I trample you today, for we belong to Jesus. The priority of our living becomes God-centered, and the power of Jesus is evident as we change activities due to a godly lifestyle. So when you have issues of persons that are referring a community, it wouldn't happen if those persons commit themselves to Jesus. Because there's no way that the Spirit of God is going to tell you to go out and break into people's homes and to rob them and rape them and to hurt them. When you and I are making decisions, political or otherwise, we don't have to think about ourselves and those who are associated with us only. We can think of everybody because the Spirit of God is not selfish and self-centered. And God will want the best for every single person in the community, regardless of what political party they may belong to. And it's their right to belong to any political party of their choice. When you and I come across persons not as desirable looking as we are, or not even as desirable sm smelling as we may smell, we don't just kick them in their behind, but we have to find a way to sit them down and tell them the realities of life. Clean up yourself, brother. Clean up yourself, sister. For it's not fair for the rest of us to have to associate with you, you deliberately behaving in that way. In other words, our honesty becomes real, even though we are not brutal in dealing with persons. You begin to see the lifestyle that I'm talking about is not simply the village we live in or the house we have or the car we drive. It's about every single and other interaction. In becoming more Christ-like, there is an intensified love relationship first with God through Jesus Christ. You and I can never say we don't have time with you, God, if we love God. We can't. And therefore, when persons can make us believe that they are so busy from Sunday back to Sunday that they have no time to worship on a regular basis, something is wrong. And the very interesting thing is that people from some other denomination can have all of their religious days off. And we believe that we can't ask for it because we don't want it. 
I've worked in all sorts of jobs. And nobody has ever asked me to work a Sunday. You know why? Because right up front, I made the position clear. I'm not available. And we must have a love relationship with God that drives us in a particular direction. And then that will lead to our horizontal relationship with each other. And yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to have conflicts. But as I said last week in another place, we must carry around the disposition of forgiving. Because we're going to have to use it all the time. I'm going to have to constantly forgive you, and you're going to have to constantly forgive me. For God, that is what God does to us anyhow. Particularly as we ask God, forgive us our sins. We know we have sinned. And even though we might have something against somebody that we don't want to release, we still go to God and ask God to forgive us our sins. Because you and I cannot carry the load of sin on our shoulder. We cannot. The Lord will kill us. Thank God for Jesus that we don't have to either. Thirdly and lastly, the completeness of Jesus' name. In relation to our health, we usually must go several places and undergo various medical treatments to be in perfect health. From Peter's speech to the people, the man who was healed received perfect health through Jesus. He did not have to go anywhere else. He was completely healed. In our battle with sin stained lives, Jesus' name is all complete for salvation and fully surrendering to Jesus brings wholeness in mind, body, and spirit. In fact, there are people who will tell you with absolute certainty that since they have received the Lord, they sleep better, they experience better health, and they're more joyful. And it doesn't mean that they have swallowed the Bible and they know all the verses in the Bible because a lot of them may not. But the Spirit of God makes a difference. The Spirit of God does not only make a difference in our spiritual lives. Everything about us has changed. Everything. But you have to want it. I have to want it. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, that when we fully surrender to the Lord and we make up our minds to live by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit means living in God. That's what it means, living in God. We make up our minds that nothing is going to change us from that. We become adopted sons and daughters according to Scripture. We can call God our Father. And a translation for that word, Abba, is Daddy. Daddy God. When a child comes to you and calls you Daddy, there is a connection between you and the child. Sometimes there's no connection, and the child might even call you by your first name, Jim, Joan. But Abba Father speaks of a closeness. We are adopted sons and daughters. And when you and I recognize who we are, who we belong to, I can tell you we will never want to go back to Satan and evil. Who will want to go back? I remember my days back in the 70s and 80s. I remember drumming around and skipping and walking out. But you know what? I don't want to go back to those conditions. We had to get in the middle of the night and go to an old closet in the yard, dark, where you had to bring water from a long distance down the road. 
when you have to walk miles to school, who will want to go back? When you and I understand the joy that the Lord gives us, why would we want to go back to Satan? Satan, let us go and let us serve our God. That is what you and I are about. And when you and I understand what we are about, we begin to make a difference in the world. We begin to transform the world because we don't encourage evil in our homes. We must desire to serve Jesus in a life of discipleship. You and I are not members of the church just to wait until someone asks us to do something. And depending on what mood we are in, we either say yes or no. You and I are disciples of Jesus Christ. And it means that every day of our lives, we see ourselves serving Jesus Christ. Being available for service, we turn up to work for the Lord, even if it's just to tell somebody a cordial hello. We must commit to being the means by which others come to experience Jesus. Brothers and sisters, between the 12th and the 15th of May, right across this country, the 26 Methodist congregations will be asking the members to go into the open air to witness over those four days. I am expecting at least 100 persons from Kingston to register with the congregational shows you will receive the training. You will receive whatever literature you must carry with you. But would you be prepared to be among the 100 plus persons from Kingston who will go into all the environs of this chapel, including downtown Kingston, and witness for people between Sunday the 12th and Wednesday the 15th? That is going to test whether we're really interested in spreading the gospel or not. The completeness of Judas' name is healed and it becomes clearer to us when we live a righteous life. It becomes clearer to us as wholeness comes to us. For when wholeness comes to our life, the image of God is restored in us. We were born in the political, the spiritual, and the moral image of God. We still have human beings, the political image that has not changed. We still have the spiritual image that has not changed. We are still spiritual people. But we have lost to sin the moral image. And that is why immorality exists. That is why we are stained by sin, because we have lost that moral image. In Jesus Christ, it is restored. And in Jesus Christ, you and I can celebrate that we can now be reconciled to God again. But all that I'm talking to you about this morning is not simply about our personal salvation. Yes, it is. But it has to be about the community salvation as well. For we must be the means of Jesus owning everything. We must be the means by which Jesus comes in to the political circles. We must be the means by which Jesus comes in to our social gathering. 
We must be the means when Jesus enters our workplaces so that all of those things change for the better. As you and I walk with the Lord seriously, the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit and the effective use of our spiritual gifts become relevant. And we are complete. Brothers and sisters, we are complete. We are ready for our heavenly home. And while we wait, we enjoy life here to the fullest in Jesus. You don't even have to be afraid to go home to your Savior when we are complete. For there's nothing to fear. If he allows us to live longer, we enjoy life longer here. And if he calls us home, we know that we go to him. Barry Warren wrote in a very beautiful hymn, and found his grace is all complete. He supplies every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy, unspeakable, and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. Where are you this morning in relation to God? Where are you this morning in relation to having this perfect health that comes because of our faith in the name of Jesus? Where are you this morning as we seek to have faith arise in our souls? I want to invite you this morning to commit to a future life in the Lord. I want to invite you this morning to allow faith to just explore and for you to embrace God in a way that perhaps you have never embraced him before. I want to ask you to do something for me this morning. We're not going to sing the other hymn yet. We're going to sing that after. I want to ask us to leave where we are and come to the altar and dedicate ourselves fully to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Come believing. Come trusting God as you release faith in the name of Jesus. Recognizing that Jesus' name is available. Recognizing the power of Jesus' name and recognizing the completeness in the name of Jesus. Would you do that for me? I ask the organist to play that hymn. I found his grace is all complete. He supplies every need. You don't have to bother if the operator can't find it. If you don't know it, just hum it. We sing the first verse over and over if necessary. Let's come. Glory to the heart of heaven. If you want to just come, we're not going to force anybody to come. We just want to invite you to commit yourself fully to the Lord today. Yes, perhaps you have accepted the Lord already in your heart. There's an opportunity to renew it. Perhaps you have never done so before. There's an opportunity to do it for the first time. Nobody's going to force you to move from where you are, but the invitation is there. Let us sing again, Brother Bailey. Where are you? If you're coming, just come and sing by heart. Dum, 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 dum.
is a joy unspeakable. Joy unspeakable. Yes, we stand in the presence of God. Yes, we just want to praise Him. We just want to give Him all the honor and all the glory. Father, you know our hearts. Lord, there's nothing about us that you don't know. You know, Lord, the problems that we are faced with. You know, Lord, the challenges that we encounter. You know, Lord, the efforts that we make, even by ourselves, to remove sin from our lives. Oh, what a mighty God you are. Oh, what a glorious God of victory you are. And we know, oh God, that Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin. We know our God that Satan to Jesus must bow. So we want to be on his side of victory today, oh God. And I thank you for every single person around this communion well. And even those who are online who are stretching out their hands right now and linking up with us, Father God. Move it for us. Move in our lives in a mighty way, God. Stir your spirit within us. And help us to be glad to be yours as you work your salvation plan within us. Help us to love you, Lord. Help us to serve you unreservedly, morning, noon, and night. Help us never to allow anyone to move us from your presence. Help us not, Lord, to give in to anyone who will want us to give up serving you in order to please them. For you alone is worthy. And Jesus has worked for us in his mighty name. So may your blessing flow upon us this morning. Upon every one of us, God. May your blessing flow upon us in a way that has never flown before. We just want to exalt you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, my sisters, my brothers. May God continue to keep you in his path. You can go back to your seats and we'll sing the hymn I sprinted. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood.